Hey, it's me, Tristan. I'm still alive. I had a baby and then I got COVID, but I got through the other side. And I've got a story to tell you about, at the time, the worst terrorist attack in American history. Now, this video is going to talk about radicalization, white power racism, misogyny, and mass death. So where's my demonetization button? Ah, excellent. There you are. Okay. So as a result, if any of that is uncomfortable to you or a lot for your lunch break, I'd give this video a pass or come back when you're in a better place. Now let's begin. Actually, before we get started, this is a movie and movies need popcorn. So let's just pop over to the kitchen for a second. Popcorn is actually pretty old. Ancient Mexicans used to make this stuff like 10,000 years ago. Have you ever wondered how they get the little kernels to pop like they do? Or did you have friends and hobbies when you were a kid? Well, I don't have any friends, so I Googled it. Inside every popcorn kernel, there's a bunch of starchy stuff, but there's also, importantly, a little bit of water. Now, when I put this in the microwave, it's going to shoot microwaves at the resonant frequency of water. And what happens is that the water molecules start to vibrate. They start to produce friction and heat and pressure starts to build up from the inside. Eventually, without anything touching the kernel at all, it pff, explodes. It was April 19th, 1995, a date picked out specifically because two years earlier, federal agents sieged the compound of the apocalypse cult, the Branch Davidians in Waco, Texas. Today would be revenge for that massacre. A man with a military haircut drove a rented rider truck into downtown Oklahoma City, just as people were making their way to work. Getting closer to his destination, the man carried on him envelopes containing pages from his favorite book, as well as revolutionary pamphlets and documents. He wore a t-shirt printed with the words, The tree of liberty must be refreshed from time to time with the blood of patriots and tyrants. At 8.50 a.m., he lit a fuse. Then he parked his rider in the drop-off zone of the Alfred P. Murrah Federal Building, a busy place, and unknowingly, the man stopped close to the office's daycare. He left, locked the truck, and calmly, walked to a getaway car just a few blocks away. At 9.02, that fuse burned down to the truck's contents. Over 2,000 kilograms, 4,800 pounds for the Americans, of ammonium nitrate, a fertilizer regularly used for farming, mixed with diesel fuel. The combination detonated with the force of over 2,200 kilograms, or 5,000 pounds, of dynamite. The explosion set off a storm of concrete and glass, killing 168 people, including 19 children in that daycare. Hundreds more were injured, and the explosion knocked out a whole third of the building. People nearly an hour's drive away felt the blast, and seismometers, devices which detected earthquakes, picked it up. The building pancaked and collapsed in on itself, burying survivors in tons of deadly rubble. The devastation was so extensive that more died in the collapse than the explosion, including one woman on the scene as part of the rescue. The loss of life, especially the lives of so many children, devastated the community and the country, really. In the hours following the blast, every television in the United States and many around the world watched in horror at this act of senseless violence. A massive car bomb exploded outside of a large federal building in downtown Oklahoma City, shattering that building, killing children, killing federal employees, military men, and civilians. At the center of it all, of course, is the bombed out shell of the federal office building, and in its shadow, the exhausted, who for a day and a half now have sifted through its debris and counted its dead and seen up close why they call it terror. Just the roar of the whole building crumbling. And where, where I was sitting, it was the only place the floor didn't cave in. I mean, right over here, the floor was gone. And what weighed on everyone was, who could do this? And almost more important, why? The original assumed perpetrator was Muslim terrorists. This was before 9-11, but the stereotype of the Muslim terrorist was already part of America's big book of racial stereotypes. The terrorist group Al-Qaeda had bombed the World Trade Center two years earlier. There were even reports of a 
whoa, tanned individual leaving the scene of the crime, so obviously, yes, this was Muslims. And yes, this assumption led to several hate crimes. But the bomber was not some radical Wahhabist from Saudi Arabia. Pretty soon into the search for the bomber, the police arrested the culprit, a man with the very crap name, Timothy McVeigh. He was not the foreigner many had assumed, even hoped for. He was a former troop, a white, conservative, Christian, libertarian troop at that. He was more or less the face of America, and he had just used a truck bomb to murder over a hundred people. He and his accomplished Terry Nichols were part of the Militia Movement, a group of far-right survivalists who grew in popularity by leaps and bounds in the early 1990s, especially after the events of Ruby Ridge and Waco. More on those events in this video. Militia members stockpiled, trained, and touched themselves in anticipation of a new civil war to finally take down the corrupt federal government, an organization they hated for many very normal and sane reasons. Were any of those reasons the like long history of oppression and imperialism the US has inflicted on poor and racialized people at home and abroad? Of course not. These are libertarians are talking about here. Their issues were with the unspeakable acts of affirmative action, abandoning the gold standard, and imposing a near non-existent control on the ownership of guns. Many of these grievances, except for maybe the gold standard thing, tapped into reactionary sentiments many Americans sympathized with. He might have been a little extreme, but his takes weren't too far from your average Republican, or at least one of today. And again, in the name of these American as apple pie values, he used a truck bomb to murder over a hundred people. How does this happen? How does some random white dude who grew up in rural New York get to the point where he's driving that rider full of explosives in front of a daycare? That's a great question I'd love to tell you. Hello, welcome to An Evil Person's Biography. Today we're going to look into the life and times of Timothy McVeigh, this guy. Now, old Timmy's life shows us a story of the kinds of things deep in the white male Christian American identity, which makes a class of people full of all that starchy potential to just pop under the right circumstances. Timothy McVeigh's life was that of a typical middle-class white American man. He grew up in New York and was reportedly fairly shy. He had trouble impressing girls and an interest in computers. In fact, reports show one key to his descent into the far right happened in the chat rooms and message boards of the early internet. A real turning point in his life, and a truly American one at that, was when his grandfather introduced him to… guns. McVeigh became obsessed, obsessed with guns. His new childhood dream was to own a gun store. Aim high, I guess. And to impress his friends, he took guns to school. Wow. White people can really get away with anything, especially in the 80s. After high school, his obsession grew to the Second Amendment of the Constitution. You know, the gun one. Also, he began reading the mercenary magazine Soldier of Fortune. And here's where his dive into the far right really began. If you've seen earlier episodes of this white power movement series, Soldier of Fortune might ring a bell. It's a magazine about weapons, but aimed at the private mercenary crowd. Mercenaries who had deep connections to far right groups like neo-Nazis and the Ku Klux Klan. Many prominent white supremacists were veterans and became mercenaries after their respective wars. They dropped into conflicts to support white supremacist governments in places like Rhodesia and did the US's dirty work in places like Central America. There, they helped far-right militias massacre indigenous people because they wanted to, I don't know, unionize or elect a social democrat or something. White power guys used this mercenary work as a way to disappear when wanted by the law. Not only did white supremacists fill mercenary ranks, but all these groups would meet and swap survival tips or ideological literature at, and this will come as quite a bit of a surprise, gun shows. Their personal and social connections built there meant the hardcore gun culture of America was 
deeply intertwined with these groups. Think of it like an analog 8chan, except with hardcore camping tips instead of whining about women existing in Star Wars and video games. When he was 20 years old, McVeigh joined the army. And even when doing basic training in bombs, guns, and tactics all day, he spent his time off learning about bombs, guns, and tactics. Here we found McVeigh in a space where he was literally trained by the government for mass murder. Now, you'll see in this video here, the army was rife with members of the white power movement. Furthermore, the veteran experience brought many a young white man into white supremacist movements. McVeigh was just one war away from having his own little stab in the back narrative. The last generation of the white power movement was led by a cadre of Vietnam veterans in a fry esque anger over being abandoned by the government. And at least to some extent, while McVeigh wasn't necessarily a foaming at the mouth neo-Nazi, he was at least white power curious. He joined the Ku Klux Klan for a year, reportedly letting his membership expire because he thought the KKK was too focused on race. Okay, bud, I'm not sure what you were expecting there. Race is like their whole thing. McVeigh also reportedly subscribed to the KKK publication White Patriot, and talked about stealing weapons from base, a tactic used by the greater white power movement. He also got reprimanded for wearing a... a white power shirt on base. Apparently he did it in protest against black service members wearing black power stuff. I don't know, what, what is it that makes white guys equivocate black and white nationalism? It seems to short circuit the part of the brain that understands context or reads books. I guess... If he was alive today, he'd have like a debate stream or something. Just want to interject here and point out that to this day, the accepted story of this guy is that he wasn't a racist. Yes, wasn't. And that he wasn't part of the white power movement. Even Robert Evans, a journalist who covers the far right and a podcaster who is essentially me, but better, is sheepish about making the connection in his book, The War on Everyone. And to be fair, McVeigh did retreat a little from explicit racism after leaving the military. But there's still some sketch reports that likely he spent some time in places like Elohim City, a white separatist Christian identity compound weeks before the attack. His path from 90s version of alt-right chud to actual terrorist began like all terrible things in 1991. And no, I will not elaborate on that. McVeigh wound up deployed in Operation Desert Storm and reportedly really got off on the ability to murder Iraqi soldiers. However, after Desert Storm, he tried to join the Special Forces and the army rejected him. Being a white man, he did not take rejection easily. McVeigh left the army in 1991 and began to work in those gun shows. After leaving the army, he started posting. He'd write letters to the local paper about why taxes are evil or so conspiracies the military had injected microchips into his ass. I'm not even joking on that one. He also experienced another common occurrence in radicalization to the far right. He had bad luck and anxiety around women. In a society where men feel entitled to women's bodies and affection, this drove him into an even deeper rage. He also had a crappy dead-end job. So essentially, Timothy McVeigh was like your kind of incel 4chan type. I point out all these personal details though because I want to draw attention to the kinds of things that radicalize young men. Toxic cultural expectations around men, toxic masculinity if you will, frustrates those who can't obtain women. Pressures to succeed financially or to achieve greatness further frustrates and builds a sense of anger and resentment which can be channeled by any number of movements, and not in a healthy way. This in no way is trying to absolve McVeigh or make him into a victim. He chose to kill over a hundred people when most single guys with crappy jobs don't. But when looking at the generation of men forming the alt-right, you begin to see some patterns. Now, I've talked before on this channel about the radicalization funnel in a modern context. You start by watching a Minecraft video where the gamer host complains about feminism during Gamergate. You then get recommended the problem with feminism video. Uh, further down, you start finding videos on the problem with social justice movements in general. 
then someone speculating on the group behind all these social justice movements. And before long, you're a Black Pigeon Speak subscriber. Wait, is he still a thing? But this was the early 90s, long before YouTube's algorithm automated the radicalization process. McVeigh needed to do a little more work and let his interest in firearms draw him into more and more far-right spaces, like gun shows. While there, he'd learn how to tie squirrel snares or something alongside neo-Nazis, Klansmen, and Krugerrand collectors. He'd make connections, have conversations, and often those conversations would go to politics. Through them, he learned conspiracies about the UN, the anti-Semitic myth of the New World Order, and worried of coming threats to liberty. Many of these subjects are very familiar to the kind spread during the Obama administration. Think about all the FEMA conspiracies, like the plans to put Americans in concentration camps, like that whole deal. In a more modern context, think of the umbrella conspiracies of things like QAnon to get what New World Order types were like in the 90s. We have some signs of McVeigh going down the rabbit hole here. He reportedly handed out the name and address of a federal agent involved in Waco and Ruby Ridge, hoping someone would assassinate him. I guess that's the 90s version of doxing. He began to spend time with his former roommate, Terry Nichols, learning how to make bombs. And he personally went to Waco to express solidarity with the Branch Davidians, thinking after that he needed to take action. The only difference between the steps McVeigh took to go from shy kid to mass murderer and the random mass shooters who spend all day in Discord servers that would give you nightmares come from basic social networks and communities. McVeigh needed a lot of face-to-face -face organizing to push him to this act of violence. The internet played a role, but it was obviously a lot smaller than it is today. Today, the internet speeds up the whole radicalization process tremendously, and now within 10 minutes, I could be in a Telegram channel full of Nazis spreading propaganda at zero cost. Those scary Discord servers are full of people who revere, nay, worship Timothy McVeigh, and they're always trying to find disaffected young men without job prospects and anger over their entitlement to women's bodies. Stopping the next Timothy McVeigh before he starts will involve a multi-pronged strategy of breaking these communication lines and changing parts of our cultural expectations, which are actively promoting this behavior. So Timothy McVeigh was on the precipice of doing something horrible. He'd be receptive to whatever dark messages someone would whisper in his ear. So the question is, who whispered in his ear? We've talked on this channel about the long road from the battles of Vietnam to the rise of a white power movement in the 1980s. They had a plan through something called leaderless resistance, more on that in a minute, to create a white supremacist ethno state in the US in an effort to move away from the explicit racism of white power once the winds started changing in America, they pushed for a rebrand. Same flavor, but now with an onion skin thick layer of plausible deniability. Jews were now the New World Order, and with the Cold War over, the evil communists were now the United Nations and the federal government. This worked perfectly. We had tons of people stocking up weapons and believing the same anti-Semitic and racist conspiracy theories. They just changed some of the names of the scapegoats, and many people believed it, thinking they were the furthest thing from racist. Those suckers were the militia movement. And by the time of the Oklahoma City bombing, it was at peak membership with cells in every state. Now, the white power movement grew out of the American Nazi Party and the Ku Klux Klan, which had a surge in membership after World War II. Its founders were people like George Lincoln Rockwell, the founder of the American Nazi Party, who, alas, should probably be the subject of his own video because I hate myself and only want to be sad. Anyway, he rallied supporters around resentment to the civil rights movement to, and tell me if this sounds familiar, promote anti-Semitic conspiracies, attack black people in their fight for equality, and attempt to return to racial segregation. And even that movement built off a long history of American racism-driven terrorism. The post-Civil War reign of terror on black people trying to exercise their new rights is today little discussed, but was essentially a guerrilla war in the American South. The Ku Klux Klan, a scourge of American history, arose in this period, again tapping into racist grievance around the emancipation of slaves. The militia movement by the time of the Oklahoma City bombing 
was just the high watermark of a centuries long process. Or I guess the high watermark so far. The militia movement's beliefs were largely taken from the white power movement, just laundered of its explicit racial messaging, which turned out to be very successful. America took to the militia movement like it did to snap bracelets and the Backstreet Boys. Okay, let's talk about leaderless resistance. It's the means that they use to communicate skills and ideology when small individual cells might not even know each other. They do this through spreading white power literature. If everyone read the same pamphlets, hold the same opinions, and know the same techniques, then they can react as they need to with each other's support while not actually having a real connection. That was how they organized these things when you didn't have like anonymous Chan boards do it for you. While McVeigh claimed he didn't like racist elements of the far right, he still absorbed the tactics and desire to inflict violence upon the state. But as we've already established, his distance from the racist right is sus. Leaderless resistance is actually something they copied off of communist guerrillas in other places, small cells with their only connection to each other being through informal social ties. Communication, when it does happen, is done through unofficial channels. It could be something like bulletin boards on the internet where authorities don't monitor much. Instead of commands and official structures, you just read the same books and think the same ideas. And through that, you get a similar idea of what to do, how to do it, and why. And this is why Timothy McVeigh put pages from his favorite book in an envelope when committing the bombing. That book was the Turner Diaries. This book is so, so, so important for understanding the cultural connections tying the militia and white power movement together, as well as the power of leaderless resistance. The Turner Diaries is a fictional novel about a white supremacist civil war to take over America, ending with the genocide of non-whites framed as a good thing. Now, you could probably understand the appeal that would have for neo-Nazis and Klansmen and the like, so they'd all read it. The book, however, is conspicuously boring in many places. Oftentimes, the book has what a casual reader would see as drawn-out descriptions of different types of targets to hit the federal government with, as well as what kind of insurgent tactics they use to win. Hmm. Now you can see passing this book around gives people with a receptive ideology a manual of tools and targets for their brand of terrorism. The militia movement, despite claiming to not be simply a rebranded white power movement, also really loved passing around the Turner Diaries, presumably because of all the same guides for how to fight the federal government. I guess they just looked the other way with all the overt racism stuff. They'd pass copies around at places where receptive people would likely be, like, say, a gun show. A gun show, someone descending down the steps of radicalization, like, say, Timothy McVeigh might be. Even if this, and this is a stretch only an Armstrong could accomplish, if the militia members aren't white supremacists, but use the Turner Diaries as a blueprint for their own libertarian war on the government, they're doing the white power movement's bidding anyway. They can claim to be not racist while doing the same things as the white power movement for largely the same reason. McVeigh putting political propaganda near the site means that the media will give their cause attention in this made-for-TV terrorist attack. The literature fueling this movement would get publicized and spread around, further fueling more stochastic terrorism from militia sympathizers around the country. Today, this is why many white supremacist mass shooters tend to shout out their favorite conservative commentators in their manifestos. We shouldn't dismiss them as just a big line of lone wolves. They're intentionally trying to seed ideas and create a cloud of thought that inspires more people to commit the same act of violence. But why don't we think about the white power movement and ties to the white supremacist far right when we talk about Timothy McVeigh and the Oklahoma City bombing? Well you're about to get very frustrated with the US federal government. McVeigh and Terry Nichols had known each other since 1988 when they met in the army. They radicalized together and felt that the ATF and FBI's actions at Ruby Ridge and Waco were not police actions, but military ones. They felt it was time to approach the FBI like they approached an enemy combatant. The first plan was to commit a spree of assassinations, including US Attorney General Janet Reno. 
and no, not Jet Reno, the engineer played by National Treasure Tignataro and the main character of Star Trek Discovery. They also planned to assassinate FBI sniper Lon Horiyunchi. That was the guy he doxed at gun shows and hoped someone would kill him, if you remember. But instead, they decided to destroy a federal building that would host the FBI, ATF, or DEA. They also intentionally looked to do this bombing during the day to kill as many people as possible. McVeigh and Nichols chose the Murrah building because it had a glass front and a large parking lot which might protect nearby buildings. The shattered glass would also create a very dramatic visual for propaganda purposes. They set a date for the anniversary of the siege at Waco, which also happened to be the 220th anniversary of the battles at Lexington and Concord, the first shots of the American Revolution. They planned for months to get all the materials they needed for the bomb. What they couldn't buy, they stole and stored all their stuff in rental sheds. Wow. What a fun storage wars that would have been. They got the explosives from a gun collector and bought the ammonium nitrate bag by bag from a farm supply co-op because it's just fertilizer. Yeah, I paused for a second when I learned fertilizer can explode too. To fund all this, they also robbed that same gun collector they got the explosives off of and blamed the government for the burglary. The bomb was assembled using simple supplies and mixed in plastic buckets using bathroom scales. Obviously, it's grossly irresponsible of me to get into the details of how they built this stuff, but it should be terrifying enough to know that this all went down with some diesel, which you can buy at any gas station, fertilizer used for farming corn, a rental truck, and a bomb made with household supplies. All in all, the bomb cost them about five grand. So good luck sleeping with that knowledge. A lot of the reason McVeigh got painted in the press as a lone wolf terrorist, despite multiple connections, both direct and indirect to white power organizations, was because the FBI intentionally tried to do so. Not wanting to see a major failure like the Fort Smith sedition trial, where many leaders of the white power movement walked free and wary of the federal government's PR after Waco and Ruby Ridge, the FBI decided to build the narrative that McVeigh was a lone wolf terrorist. They even withheld evidence gathered of his connections to build a case that McVeigh acted alone and not part of a larger leaderless resistance network. They intentionally didn't follow up on leads as well as apparently some very credible eyewitnesses. Or if they did, they wouldn't disclose the evidence. Like for example, the FBI didn't check into a pretty big lead that he spent a bunch of time at that white separatist compound Elohim City I mentioned earlier, where they practiced the white supremacist Christian identity faith. And while the government did try to crack down on these militia groups planning an overthrow of the government, as we've seen before, their efforts to tackle white supremacists in the far right are way weaker than, say, attacking leftists or even liberals. This was ultimately a failed opportunity to investigate the deep connections between the militia movement of the 90s and the white power movement of the 80s. And so while the militia folks were in the spotlight, no one made the connection. It wasn't until researchers like Kathleen Ballou looked into the evidence decades later that the lineage from Louis Beam to Timothy McVeigh really came together. And the FBI being so cagey during the trial didn't help with the spreading of conspiracy theories. There is to this day still an Oklahoma City truther movement claiming either that the FBI set McVeigh up, let him go through with it, or orchestrated the bombing themselves and used McVeigh as a fall guy. This is despite McVeigh's own insistence he planned and did the attack. To this day, anytime militia folks get caught planning a terrorist attack, conspiracies rise that it was the FBI who did it for reasons. And because of this utter failure to investigate deeper into the pathways of radicalization and networks connecting McVeigh to a wider white supremacist movement, the perception of the Oklahoma City bombing is that McVeigh acted as a lone wolf. You can, however, looking at his history, see clear lines of connection where the leaderless resistance and recruitment methods of the white power movement to evade the law to sanitize their racism worked perfectly. McVeigh believed in anti-Semitic conspiracy theories and carried out war goals for a group made up of Klansmen and neo-Nazis while thinking himself to be not racist, maybe. 
Though I'd argue a non-racist doesn't join the clan or spend a lot of time at a white separatist identity Christian compound. But maybe that's just me being a rad lib with too many purity tests. Either way, the lack of an investigation left that out of our concept of what happened. Now it's almost 30 years later and people still don't know this. It's very similar to our narrative around the Columbine shooting. I'll link to an Ask a Mortician video on that really cool and very sad story. Authorities arrested McVeigh not too long after the bombing, but not through clever police work, but sheer luck. His getaway car had its plates blown off in the explosion, and the police arrested him for driving without them. Only at the station did someone point out he fit a John Doe description, and they fingered him for his part in the bombing. They fingered him. There's a, there's a joke in that somewhere. McVeigh was sentenced to death. Terry Nichols got acquitted of murder and only got a manslaughter sentence. He helped build the bomb, but they didn't have anything solid linking him to the purchase of fertilizer or renting the truck. He ended up getting life in prison where he is to this day. But 10 years later, an investigation of his house found hidden explosives. In 2009, he admitted to helping mix the ingredients of the bomb, but appeals courts chose not to let him testify. The discovery of the FBI's withheld evidence did delay his execution somewhat, but on June 11, 2001, the federal government executed McVeigh by lethal injection. The first federal prisoner executed in almost 40 years. All the potential information he could have provided on the white power, militia, underground movements, information which could have been used to dismantle these networks, died with him. The militia movement began to decline after Oklahoma City for four primary reasons. First, the government did put some effort to disrupt and shut down militia groups across the country. There were some high profile standoffs with some extreme militia groups, but it became obvious that the benevolent neglect from the authorities was coming to an end. Second, their recruitment dropped as the full horrible weight of their ideas alienated mainstream America. Third, also, they kind of won. Many gun control measures proposed in the 90s failed, and the militia's concern about a crackdown on guns began to sate. And lastly, which is important for the next video in this series, they just got co-opted by the normie right. The Republican Party took a big lurch to the right, and some leaders of the militia movement just became the GOP. Oklahoma City should have been a moment of awakening for many Americans to the far-right threat developing in their midst unheeded by the state. Instead, the narrative turned McVeigh into a lone wolf. He'd go on to inspire other acts of mass violence such as the Columbine school shooting. We're seeing this today in what non-competes American Johnson so eloquently described as stochastic terrorism. Just keep agitating that entitlement, resentment, and racism in all those little white man colonels and without a centralized authority you just wait for them to pop. So what I'm saying is, the feds not using this case to investigate this network was a lost opportunity to stop something in its tracks. And while there was a distinct decline in activity in this space after, the white power movement merely went into remission until it could metastasize again later. Because they would be back. When Barack Obama won the White House in 2008, it sparked a massive resurgence in Klan membership, white power recruitment, and a return in a big way to new, militarized, far-right white guys with extremely similar language to the militia folks of decades past. And then, of course, we know what happened after Obama left office. But that is a story for the next and final episode in this sordid tour through America's white power movement. I can't believe I did a whole video with popcorn as a metaphor for radicalization. What the hell am I doing with my- In the meantime, check out the whole series. If you haven't yet, subscribe to make sure you see the conclusion when it comes out. Thank you to my patrons, and come back soon for more Step Back. Okay, now let's talk about leaderless- Leaderless- Leaderless-